Welcome to this morning service. It's good to see you once again. Hope that you've had a good week and that you've known God's blessing. It's good to be back at Mount Elim today after being in Crickowell last week. And I hope and pray and trust that James's ministry was a blessing to you last week. Tonight we'll be meeting on Zoom for a communion service at 6 o'clock. Then during the week we've got Cloponti and Impact Youth at 5.30 and 7 o'clock Tuesday. Prayer meeting on Wednesday, do come along. If you can to that, it's on Zoom. And then on Thursday, remember Busy Bees will be meeting at 9.30. Busy Bees now meeting indoors, but on Thursdays instead of Tuesdays. And then next week, I'll be preaching once again at Mount Elim. If you'd like to come along, 10 o'clock or 11.30, you're welcome to do so. And then we'll have a Zoom meeting in the evening at 6 o'clock. Tryon is going to read for us now. And then we look at Hebrews chapter 12, praying that it will be a blessing to you as well. Therefore, 
since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith, for the joy was set before him, he endured the cross, scoring its shame, and sat down on the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as a father addresses his son? It says, My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline, and do not lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines the one he loves, and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? If you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate, not true sons and daughters at all. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of spirits and life? They disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good, in order that we may share His holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Make level paths for your feet, so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. I don't know about you, but I've never hit the wall while running or walking. But I can imagine what it must feel like. I usually give up before I reach that point. Maybe you've seen them on TV. We've got the uh, Tokyo Olympics happening in a few weeks' time. Uh, and I'm sure there we might see a long-distance runner or a triathlete hit the wall. The heavy arms flapping by their sides, wobbly knees, weak legs. They are wobbling and they are swaying, arms flailing everywhere. And perhaps they have to be carried over the crossing, uh, uh, the finishing line, uh, or perhaps they don't even reach the finishing line and uh, they fall to the ground and they've hit the wall. They can't carry on, they can't finish a race. This is the image we have in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2 let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. And then at the end of this passage, verse 12, therefore strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Make level paths for your feet. The church receiving this letter has hit the wall. The founding leaders have died. There's been a measure of persecution. There is pressure from within the church and from outside the church for them to revert to their Jewish customs and traditions and beliefs. The Lord Jesus is being degraded to the level of Abraham and Moses. They are worshipping angels instead of Jesus. And so doubt and disobedience, disillusionment have been allowed to enter the church. And so they are struggling to run the race. They are struggling to persevere. They are not keeping going. Verse 12 of chapter 3, see to it that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the Lord. Chapter 4, verse 1, be careful that one of you be found to have fallen short. And so the author to the Hebrews encourages them. He is like a coach on the sidelines, telling them to keep going. 
ran with perseverance the race marked out. Don't give up. Don't quit now. Keep running. Keep persevering. True faith endures. Over the last few weeks we've been looking at Hebrews chapter 11. We see there what true faith is. Verse 1, faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. It is having this assurance. And the faith then was illustrated as we looked at the various uh, figures from the Old Testament. In chapter 12, the author wants to remind them that true faith endures. True faith, by God's grace, perseveres. True faith is not like a firework that shines brightly for a second and vanishes out of sight. It is not a short-term boost of enthusiasm or some feelings that fizzle out as quickly as they came. True faith endures. It keeps going. It is never extinguished. Sometimes it might flicker dimly in a very weak way. But the flame is never extinguished. It keeps burning. And this is what you've seen in Hebrews 11. You think of all of these great brothers and sisters, these heroes of the faith, how they persevered through trials and all sorts of suffering, terrible physical persecution. You think of the parable of the sower, again showing the nature of true faith and true life. That... Some people hear the word and there is this initial enthusiasm, but there is no root. And when trials come, they wither away straight away. What is the fruit of the Spirit? What are there some of the evidences of the presence of God in our lives? Well, love and joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness and faithfulness. Patience and faithfulness. This is a mark of true faith. Patience, despite trials, is keeping going. Faithfulness to the Lord. You might be aware today, perhaps, that you are struggling. Perhaps you are aware that you are wobbling spiritually. That you're not as strong as you once were. And perhaps you are drooping, you are heavy laden. There's a loss of enthusiasm. Emotionally, you're not as vibrant as you were. You are not as prayerful as you used to be. You don't thank God as you did previously. You don't turn to the Bible for guidance. And you are perhaps characterised by these things yourself. Doubt, disobedience, disillusionment. How can we keep on going? How can we run the race with perseverance? How can we make sure that we don't give up? What will give us that spring in our step? That injection of pace? And that willingness to keep on going, even when it is difficult. What can help us? Well, this is where Hebrews 12 is great, and it really gives us some instructions and guidance. There'll be some overlap today with what James referred to last week. He looked at the end of chapter 11, beginning of chapter 12, and so there'll be a little bit of overlap at the beginning of today's message. But it's always good to hear these things again, of course. First thing, how can we run the race with perseverance? How can we keep going? First thing, look at those who have already finished the race. Verse 1, since we have a great cloud of witnesses. In the original Olympic Games in Greece 2,000 years ago, a competitor would finish a race. He wouldn't go for a drug test or a press conference or go back to the Olympic Village. But he would go back to uh, the equivalent of the stands that they had then uh, and they would cheer on the other competitors. It would be more like a school sports day when the children, they finish a race and they go and sit with their friends. Uh, they sit and they encourage. They tell them to keep going. I've done, I bet I've run my race. Now you can keep going. You can keep running and go for that reward, go for that prize. Adam Peaty was the first Briton to win a gold medal at the Rio Olympics. You can imagine him going back to the Olympic village with that gold medal. And this would have inspired the others to keep going, to keep training, to keep focused on the goal. Not to be distracted yet, but to face that race, to go for it. 
and to keep going, knowing that they too might get their reward. And so the author is saying here, look at this great cloud of witnesses that we are surrounded by. It's as if they are cheering us on. Now, we need to emphasize, of course, and especially in our culture, that this is just an image. He's not speaking in literal terms here. The Bible is very clear that there is a gulf between the living and the dead. Uh, that uh, we go to the spiritual realm after our death. That those who trust the Lord Jesus go to paradise to be with him. And those who have not face judgment and condemnation. And there is no crossing from one to the other. People say, oh, my grandmother is looking down on me. Oh, my father is with me in spirit. But this is not biblical teaching. There is no crossing from one realm to the other. Those who have passed away are not with us in spirit. They do not see our lives. They are in glory or they are in judgment. This is an image. This is an illustration we are to be encouraged by our memories of them, the legacy that they have left behind. As we remember how they lived, as we remember how they worshipped God, how they persevered. Hebrews 13 verse 7 tells us, remember your leaders who spoke, spoke the word of God to you. Now Hebrews 12 verse 20 is saying the same thing, but in more poetic and colourful language. Remember your leaders, remember the giants of the faith. Remember those brothers and sisters who inspired you, who helped you. Remember their faith and copy them, emulate them, imitate them. Remember where they are now and let that encourage you as, as if they are spurring you on. And this great cloud of witnesses. We can look back at giants of the faith. Those who kept going year after year. Now we've seen many of them in Hebrews 11. That's a significant. The uh, the initial list, of course, the great cloud of witnesses as he's referring to are those in Hebrews 11. People who believed in something which seemed remarkable, which seemed impossible in the eyes of the world. Sarah who believed that she would conceive in her 90th year. Oh, Moses, who believed, and Abraham, who believed in a promised land that would be given to them. They had this faith. They trusted God. The prophets who suffered terrible persecution, the world was not worthy of them. Remember how these people had faith in that which they cannot see and could not see. And how they persevered regardless, despite the suffering and the persecution. Great preachers, great prophets, great leaders. And so we can look to people in the scriptures. We can look to people in the history of the world, in the history of the church, those people who have inspired us. And that's why it's so important to read biographies of historical figures, to read lives of great saints, to read of great testimonies, to be inspired. Well, how did they cope? How did they persevere? What did they do in the face of suffering? How did they respond to trials and temptations? How did they overcome the barriers and the obstacles that they had to face? What can we learn from their examples? People in our lives who've inspired us, parents or grandparents, a dear Sunday school teacher, a godly friend, a youth group leader or an elder or a, a pastor. We thank God for them. And they are included in this great cloud of witnesses and that spur us on. As we remember their faith, as we remember the example they set, as we remember how they responded to challenges and to attacks and trials, and as we remember where they are now by God's grace, that they have finished the race, that they are receiving their reward and glory, seeing Jesus face to face in heaven. That is where they are. And so this should inspire us, this should encourage us. Come on, it's worth it. You might suffer for a few years in this world and yet you've got an eternity in front of you. This weight of glory, which is far greater and more significant than any trouble or suffering you might 
facing this life. Let's have that perspective. Remember that throughout everything, God is with us. And ultimately, we will finish a race and we'll be with him forever and ever. This great cloud of witnesses, they're not in the stands with a piece of gold around their necks. They're in the presence of Jesus. And they are receiving the crown promised to them. No suffering, no fighting, no enemy. They're with God in his dwelling place. And so it's as if they're saying, come on, keep going. So can I encourage you to look to the examples of those who've gone the way and who've already gone to heaven, those who've passed away. Remember how they lived. Remember how they responded to the challenges, how they persevered, how they read the scriptures, how they loved God's word, how they loved the Lord Jesus and how they are now in his presence. The second thing we're told to do is to look at our lives Verse 1 again, let us throw off everything that hinders us and the sin that so easily entangles. I'm sure you've heard that in the original Olympics. Uh, they did not wear much clothing at all because you think of the clothing at that time, long robes, and it would have entangled them. They would have been tripped up. And so they took as much clothing off as possible so that they would not be held back so that they could finish the race. They didn't have lycra then. They didn't have these aerodynamic clothes. And so they made sure that everything was streamlined and that nothing would trip them up. They didn't wear long robes or hats. They made sure that they could finish the race with nothing to trip them up. And the author tells us here, to throw off everything that hinders us and the sin that so easily entangles. One of the great lessons of the initial lockdown in particular this time last year was how many of us realised how busy our lives were and how distracted we had been before COVID. Perhaps we were not particularly smart about the things that we were doing we were he living hectic lives, going from one place to the other, mindlessly, without thinking, just doing one thing after another, filling our days up with hobbies and interests, making our children's lives busier and busier, trying to keep up with friends, trying to make sure that we can experience what they're experiencing, that, you know, that we can achieve everything and Lockdown came and it put some perspective on things, didn't it? As we realised what is truly important. It is so easy for us to become entangled. Our lifestyle choices can mean that there is no time for church. There's no time for the Bible. There's no time for prayer. There's no time for being with God's people. The things which we know are significant. The things which we know which will help us to grow in our faith. Well, they are squeezed out of our lives because of some of the decisions we've made. That hobbies and interests have become idols. Becoming more important to us than God himself. They have a greater significance to us. And God is, is squeezed to the fringes. Get rid of these things. If they... Uh, causing an obstacle between us and God, if they are hindering our walk with the Lord, if it means that we're not growing in our faith, if we can't serve the Lord or serve his people. Anxieties and worries, refusing to deal with them, refusing to respond in a, in a suitable and biblical and godly way to these emotions, they can drag us down. The Bible helps us to deal with anxiety and worry, it tells us, how we can deal with them. Perhaps we need to ask God to help us in this situation so that we, we're not held back, that we're not hindered by them. Perhaps there's a fear of other people's reactions. Perhaps we are being held back spiritually because we are concerned about what friends might say or think or how family members might respond to us. We've got to shake off that fear of man We've got to shake off that fear of other people's reactions. And then there are all sorts of sinful thoughts and sinful attitudes and sinful behaviour that we can't shake off. They are too precious to us. 
uh, we, we want, we enjoy them too much and ultimately they are causing us to s slow down in our faith. They are hindering us, they are entangling us, they are tripping us up. Can I encourage you today to listen to this verse here and to throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Ask God to help you to search your heart. We thought about this on Wednesday evening in the prayer meeting, how Hezekiah had this pride in his heart and it slowed him down spiritually. He became prayerless and, and he was less thankful to God. He needed to repent of it. I wonder what is in your heart. What is in your life at the moment, which is causing an obstacle between you and God, hindering you in your spiritual walk, in your spiritual journey. It's a very personal thing. There's a multitude of things which could hinder us. So can I encourage you to search your heart, to be wise, to be godly. It might be difficult if these have become central to your life. It might become difficult to how to respond to them. Chat with me, chat with others in the church. Pray to God that he might be given wisdom to how to have this right balance in your life. So that God is at the centre. His word is truly your anchor. And that you receive the means of grace. That you can love and worship God, love and worship his people and be salt and light in the community. I leave this to your conscience, really. I could give a whole list of examples. But I think the best thing is for me to leave it to your conscience. What are the things which are causing you to stumble in the faith? What are the things which are holding you back from persevering? That's causing you perhaps to feel doubt or despair or disobedience. Let us throw it off. Let us get rid of those things in a ruthless way which cause us not to walk with the Lord. The third thing is to look at Jesus, and this is the most important thing of all. Fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. What will give us the motivation to keep going? It is one thing to have a, a dogged desire to keep going. It is another thing to have a, a sense of duty, but to actually want to have this the burning desire within us to keep going, to have this, this motivation. What will give us motivation to keep going for 20, 30, 40 years or more? What will give us perseverance when we hear those doubting words, when we hear dissenting voices, when we see this sin that has entangled us and we can't shake it off because well, we cherish it too much? What gives us that willingness and that ability to keep going? Well, it's a love for Jesus, to worship him, to worship by the triune God, Father, Son and Spirit. A lady in our church in Aberystwyth, she was in her 80s and she had this joy in her face. And she would say, well, every day is a day nearer to the Lord. She knew that to die is gain. She fixed her eyes on the Lord Jesus. She knew him. She experienced him in his life. She had the knowledge of his presence. Uh, and so this gave her such a, a wonderful perspective on life. She's able to face suffering and trials today, knowing that God is with her. And she didn't fear the future because she knew she would go and see the Lord Jesus. What will help us to persevere? What will enable us to persevere? By the Holy Spirit giving us the grace to see the Lord Jesus and to fix our eyes upon him day by day. This is what true faith is, really. It's to see him. We cannot see him physically, but we see him with eyes of faith. And so we keep going. Are you concerned that you might not finish the race? Are you afraid maybe of falling short? Are you aware that you are starting to harden your heart and you are afraid of this and you don't want to? You are aware that God is calling you back. Well, fix your eyes on Jesus. This is the answer. The more I look at Jesus, the more I look at his life, the more I look at his teaching, the more I look at his death, his resurrection and his ongoing life and ministry in heaven. As I think of his kingship and his lordship, the more I want to worship him. 
I want to fix my eyes upon him and to have this fresh love for the Lord Jesus every day. This is what's happened throughout the whole of church history. Abraham, what enabled him to actually leave the air of Chaldeans and to go? Well, he saw the Lord and he heard his word. Ezekiel was able to prophesy because he saw the glory of the Lord. He saw one with the appearance of the Son of Man on the throne. Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, they saw the Son of God with them in the fire. The Apostle Peter preached on the day of Pentecost and his focus was on the Lord Jesus. Stephen, the first martyr, was given a vision of the Lord Jesus on the throne. Do you see, they were able to persevere, they were able to face trials, they were able to face difficulties because God, by his grace, gave them a new vision of Jesus. They saw his glory, they saw his power, they saw his authority, they saw his, his, his love, his compassion, they heard his word and they trusted in him. They remembered who Jesus is. He's the author and perfecter of our faith and there are many ways of interpreting that verse but ultimately in essence it means this and that our faith originates in the Lord Jesus. We are told that we in the scriptures that we were called and chosen back in eternity before the foundation of the world. So everyone who's a Christian is a Christian because of God's grace, his electing grace and then we are called in time here in our lives we become aware of the fact that we are sinners and where do we go for forgiveness we go to the lord jesus we look to him and he is the one who has guaranteed forgiveness for us by his death and so he's the author and he's the perfect of our faith he sends the holy spirit to help us to grow in our faith to help us to pray he shapes us he renews us daily Everything we have, physically and spiritually, is because of God. It's because of all that Christ has accomplished for us by his life, death and resurrection. We have no physical life, we have no spiritual life, we have no hope, we have no future glory without the Lord Jesus. He is the author and the perfect, he is the beginning and the end. He is everything. We have nothing without him and so fix your eyes upon him. Appreciate his glory, appreciate his beauty, appreciate his teaching and remember that you are forgiven and that you have life, that you have a relationship with God the Father because of the Lord Jesus. Pray to the author of your faith and he will help you in your unbelief. He will give you strength. So look to him. He's also the best example of faith. We look to Jesus because he has been where we have been, but to an even deeper and greater degree. Verse 2, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. You might be going through trials yourself at the moment, facing difficulties, and you're not sure if you can carry on. Maybe you're overwhelmed by all that you're going through. It's just too much. Well, remember what the Lord Jesus endured. He endured the cross, scorning its shame, the mockery of the cross, to be tempted by the devil, to be forsaken by his father. He endured all of this. How? Because he saw the joy that was set before him. He knew that he would be sat, seated at the right hand of the majesty. And so he kept going. He saw the unbelief. He saw the rejection. He saw the darkness right at the heart of humanity. And yet he still kept going because he, his eyes were fixed on heaven and the glory that he would receive. And so he becomes an example. We look to the Lord Jesus because he can help us, because he can strengthen us, because he can minister to us in our situation, but also because he sets a pattern for us to follow. Look to how he responded. Look to the joy that is before you. 
again have this perspective that you might be suffering now but it will come to an end and you will go to be with the Lord Jesus and so you can keep fighting now you can keep struggling now you can keep persevering because you know what how the Lord Jesus did that as well and then the fourth thing is to look at the goodness of God the Father so what do we do well we're going through trials we're going through difficulties let us look to those who've finished a race let us be inspired by them let us look to our lives to make sure that there is nothing entangling us that there is no sin which is tripping us up let us look to the lord jesus the author and perfect of our faith let's fix our eyes on him so that we are motivated to keep going and that we are encouraged by his example and then let us look at the goodness of god the father we haven't got many, uh, much time to, to look at uh, these verses here. Uh, There's a lot of time to consider what we are told in these verses. But one reason why we might not persevere, one reason why we might be tempted to give up, is that we are suffering and we don't understand why we are going through this experience. Why do we have to face this trial? Why do we have to face this anguish and this torment? And so it is so important for us to remember the goodness of God the Father, how he treats us as children. You have forgotten the words of encouragement, he says in verse 5. My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline. Do not lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines those he loves. And he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. And do a hardship as discipline, God is treating you as sons now there are times in our lives when we suffer not because we've done anything wrong it is not right to say that suffering is cause and effect and that you are suffering because of a sin you've committed and that is destructive teaching it is cruel and unbiblical teaching and there are times when we suffer because we live in a fallen world because we live in a world where there are diseases, where there are sicknesses. And there are times when we suffer because of our own selfishness. There are times when we are suffering because of the consequences of our actions. And there are times when God might allow us to go through a time of suffering in order to awaken us, to train us. And whatever suffering we face, it is always designed by God to train us. This is why James can say, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Now, the author to the Hebrews focuses on a suffering which comes as the Lord rebukes us in order to awaken us, in order to, uh, to, to, to rouse us. But it's true in every situation that suffering trains us, suffering moulds us, suffering shapes our character. I'm thinking again of this whole illustration of the sportsman as he goes to that gym, as he exercises. It is difficult, it is painful, that toil and the labour, but ultimately it's worth it as it leads to strength and endurance. And so we remember that we have a God, a Father in heaven, who is sovereign over all things. No experience is wasted. No experience happens against God's will and purpose. Everything is according to his perfect and good plan. And he has this desire and he has this willingness to use us in order to mould us and to shape us. That is all that of the for our good no discipline seems pleasant at the time but painful later on however it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it you might be tempted to give up at the moment because there's just too much suffering perhaps it is just too much you've had enough of the mockery of your friends you've had enough of the rejection of of your family members it is just too much the, the doubts, the questions, remember that the Lord is your Father in heaven and that he uses all of these experiences to train you, 
And so instead of seeing these things as difficult experiences that will crush you, see them as experiences to grow in your faith. Turn to God more. Pray to God more. Ask him to help you to know how to respond to these trials and these challenges so that you yourself then will produce a harvest of righteousness. Remember that God is good. Remember that God is on your side and that even the trials you are facing ultimately will be used for your good and for God's glory. I remember hearing a lady who had been imprisoned in Serbia in solitary confinement minus 40 degrees and she said it has a year of joy because she experienced the Lord's presence with her. She was moulded. She knew God's presence. And so even in the suffering, she could trust and she could grow. And so how do we keep going? How do we run the race? How do we persevere? Well, be encouraged by those who already finished a race. Remember that they are now in heaven. They are receiving their reward. Remember how they responded to trials, how they responded to challenges and be encouraged by them. Look at your life. Is there anything that's hindering you? Is there anything that's entangling you? Well, throw it off. Ask God to give you that right perspective that you might walk with him and trust and obey him day by day. Look to Jesus. Fix your eyes upon him, the author and perfecter of your faith. Be inspired as you are filled with wonder and love and worship. And remember how he responded to suffering himself. And then look at the goodness of God the Father, that when you are going through suffering, when you are going through difficulties, that he is good. And through all of this, he is at work to mould you and to shape you and to make you more and more like the Lord Jesus. And so he says, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Make level paths for your feet. Keep going. Keep running by God's grace. Ask him to fill you with his spirit that you might feel that burst of energy, that spur and that spring in your step to keep going. So true faith endures. True faith perseveres by God's grace. So let's pray and let's ask him to give him strength to keep going. Amen.